Welcome back, everyone, uh, to our afternoon budget hearings. I'd like to reconvene the Finance Committee, uh, along with our other colleagues, and I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Evans? Present. Councilmember Harris? Present. Councilmember Patterson? Here. Vice President Lightfoot? Present, ma'am. President Scott? Here. Thank you. We also are joined by Council Members Gruber, Lupian, Ortiz, and Pio. Um, this afternoon, we're going to hear from the Rochester Fire Department, Department of Recreation and Youth Services, and the Emergency Communications Department. Um, we will follow the, the same format that we did this morning in terms of uh, questions being asked. And again, if uh, time does not permit, we will. you can submit your questions in writing. And if there is a burning desire, we do have time held on the calendar to reconvene for uh, what we call adjourned hearings if we run out of time. With that, I want to get right to the fire department. I want to thank the chief for uh, being here. And uh, Mr. Uh, chief, I want to turn it over to you uh, to make uh, introductions of your team and any statements that you'd like to make. Thank you. Thank you, council. You know, and thank you, council, for allowing us to review our budget here today. I'd like to introduce my team. Uh, they're from our staff, and some of them are subject matter experts, and some of them are department heads. But let me introduce them, and we can get started. Uh, so first, I have Executive Deputy Chief Felipe Hernandez, Deputy Chief Teresa Everett, Deputy Chief Christine Shriver, Deputy Chief Andrew Lanthier, Deputy Chief James Ryan, Principal Staff Assistant Kathy McManus, Battalion Chief Dave Compton, Battalion Chief Michael Doverton, Battalion Chief James Hartman, Battalion Chief Joseph Luna, Captain Michael Nolte, Captain Edward Cuppinger, Lieutenant Darren Batty, Lieutenant Jamie Renner, Lieutenant Dan Curran, Lieutenant Ryan Fleming, Lieutenant Doug Knapp, Repair Shop Superintendent Robert Hoffman, and Firefighter Jared Jones. And with that, you know, I, I'll turn it over to council to review the budget and ask questions. Thank you. Um, Vice President Lightfoot, you have questions? Start with uh, you. Yes, sir. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman Evans. And uh, I want to say uh, just good afternoon to everybody in the fire department. I haven't seen a lot of your faces <laughs> in quite some time. It's good to see you all. Um, I, want, I would start, I have a few questions, but I'm not going to try to hog the mic here. I will try to uh, be as expeditious as I possibly can be. Uh, my first question, are we going through the entire department, uh, Mr. Chairman, or are we going through pages? There's only three sections in this department, 10-1 okay. to 10-9. 10, 10, so go ahead. If you have questions because, because of time, and I don't want people to miss being able to ask a question on a, on, on a, because of a section, um, just, just any questions, uh, Mr. Vice President, from 10-1 to 10-20 you have, feel free. OK. Um, so. The, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so my first question is around uh, the elimination on page 10-3, the elimination of firefighter recruit class due to budget constraints. Uh, of course, we understand what COVID is, is doing to our overall budget, but I'd just like to ask, and I think I've asked it in a chair's meeting or committee meeting before, but I'd like to just go on the record as, uh, what are we doing? Uh, can you just explain the uh, thought process behind that as well as what are we doing? We talked earlier in our budget hearing earlier under the administration about uh, the recruitment and all of these efforts that have been taking place, of course, due to uh, us trying to bring more minorities, of course, on the job and things of that nature, people who live in the city. So then we have COVID, of course, and now we're uh, eliminating a, a firefighter recruit class due to budget constraints. I'd like to ask what is the thought process behind that and or uh, how are we keeping these individuals engaged uh, throughout you know, while they're waiting for it to go forward? So, uh, excellent question. Uh, you know, first of all, COVID caused us to have a delay in the current recruit class. We realized we weren't going to be able to meet our July deadline and that that class would be pushed back, which would have pushed the recruit class out for a period of time anyways. We would not have been able to start when we normally start in January. So, as we are going through budget, to try and save money, one of the things we looked at, we had we would have a 13 person overhire because we didn't have as many uh, retirements as we thought we would this year. 
So with the 13 over hire, we looked at the possibility of not having a recruit class. So what we basically decided on was we would push the recruit class out to the following year or following fiscal year so that we could save money and uh, in the budget. So basically it was based upon the fact that one COVID had delayed the current class, which was gonna cause it, the next class to be delayed anyways. We had a 13 person over hire because we didn't have as many retirements as we had expected for the 1920 year. So with the over hire, we looked at uh, what the possibility would be if we canceled the class and we found out that we could cancel the class, keep our uh, numbers up and not have any uh, residual effect on, on our staffing. As far as uh, recruitment is concerned and the recruit class, we have sent letters out. We are putting information on our website, how they can stay engaged, what they can do to continue preparing for you know, the physical fitness test, uh, backgrounding and, and so forth for the future. The one negative to this all is that we were looking at trying to work a two year uh, cycle into our uh, testing and we may have to push that out a year. So instead of being able to do two years, we may have to go with a three year test so that we can keep this list for at least two years. Now, as, as far as the list is concerned, there, uh, there, I don't, couldn't see where I, it was in here, but there is a current captain's list that's current now. Are you planning on continuing that list, extending that list because of everything that's going on? Or, or, or are you looking to, to start that process over? No, no, we have a captain's test. The announcement was sent out, uh, I believe it's June, late June. I don't have the exact date in front of me. I can get that to you. But we do have a captain's test that's going to uh, be given in June, and the current list will go until that list is uh, that test is scored, and then we'll put that list in place. So we still have a few months on the current list. The previous list, uh, the the previous list that we have will be extended. It won't be extended, but it will be carried out carried out until we have uh, the new list in place. Do you anticipate any hires from the old list uh, before the new list is scored and, and brought out? So we have one captain that has stated that he plans on retiring sometime between August and November. If he retires before that list is in place, then we can definitely promote someone, but it all depends on the timing of his retirement and when the list goes in place. Okay. Uh, my next question, I just have two more and then I'll, I'll be out the way. My next question is on radios. Now, this is something that, you know, I've been dealing with back when I was in the county legislature. This has been a very controversial, a very long journey. Uh, I know that, I, I believe I saw um, uh, Battalion Chief Doberton on the phone. We were both a part of the transition team uh, for the Adam Bellow transition team. We were on public safety for that. We had a lot of conversation around these radios and the CAD system and I mean, it's just been a myriad of, of questions and unanswered questions by the county on that. Where are we with these radios and how do you guys feel right now as far as uh, uh, launching that program? Well, I'll give you my idea and then I, you know, I will allow uh, Captain Doberton to ring in on this, but basically right now we are moving forward as if nothing has happened. We're trying to keep our timelines with training, radio transition, purchasing so that when the, time, when the county starts to move forward with this again, we're able to meet their timelines. Right now, because of COVID, uh, we've, uh, they've shut down a lot of their transitionary teams and we don't have any, any idea when they'll be re-implemented. So basically what we're doing is we're continuing on with our process and we're trying to make sure that when they do re-implement their teams, we're ready to go. So, and that includes training, that includes purchases of radios. We have teams set up to organize how we're going to do training, teams set up how we're going to implement station uh, alerting, how we're going to set up our radios, and so forth. And if you need more information, we can get you something on that. Uh, Chief Compton and Chief Doberton have been working on that. We have an RFP about to go in for uh, station alerting. So, we're trying to stay ahead of the game with this. 
as we really have a lot of unknowns with the county on what their timelines are going to be. Uh, I don't know if COVID and lately all the protesting is going to push back all of that. And with the new administration, if that's going to create a delay in implementing all of this. So well, we are ready to go forward when they do decide to uh, implement their, uh, their CAD system and the new trunk system. If you'd like, uh, I can give, you know, if uh, you want, I can either have uh, Battalion Chief Doberton send you something offline or I can have them speak right now to it if you wish. Uh, it doesn't have to be right now. It'd be nice though for Battalion Chief uh, Doberton if you can give the council through BJ, our Chief of Staff, if you can give us an update on that because I know there was a lot of issues and concerns about the safety of our firefighters, the safety of our police officers, uh, concerning this new trunk system we see across the country that there's been issues with these. I just want to make sure that people are comfortable with that and that we have a plan going forward that provides the, the most adequate safety for our first responders. So, so we have, uh, we're, we're constantly monitoring this and the transition. You know, we, I did send out a letter early on that we wouldn't meet our, uh, some of our mutual aid obligations because they were transitioning to the trunk system before we were ready. We've done some testing. Uh, we've also acquired some uh, new radios where we can actually use them on the trunk system. So we are implementing some of our um, mutual aid agreements. We are honoring some of those. So just so you know, we are monitoring, monitoring that day to day to make sure that when we do transition with the county, we will be prepared and that we will do it safely. Okay, my final question is overall on fire prevention and community engagement. Uh, I don't see a lot in the document uh, concerning uh, fire prevention, uh, community engagement, uh, and I know that that's a major part of the work that's done. And I just wanted you know, to speak to, in this budget, uh, what, what resources uh, and tactics and strategies uh, are going to be done for fire prevention and overall community engagement? Well, right now, you know, we still have our, our, our person that's in uh, community risk reduction and he still plans on doing prevention. Right now, everything is shut down because of COVID. And, you know, the festivals, you know, a lot of our engagement goes with festivals, nursing homes, uh, senior citizen facilities. And at this time, everything is shut down. So we're unable to participate. We have budgeted for uh, our people to participate in fire prevention activities. It's just a matter of when are they gonna open and when can we do it safely? I do have Jared Jones here with us, you know, he can, if there's some programs, I can have him send you something on all of the programs that, you know, he has been working on and what we plan on doing once we reopen. Okay, I, I would just uh, ask for consideration, Chief, that um, I know that we're, we're closed, the COVID is happening, but we've seen uh, our administration take outside of the box and different approaches to engage in the community during these crises. And I think that there are other ways, other than in-person ways, that we can get out fire prevention information to our overall community in our senior facilities, in other facilities, uh, internet, uh, uh, different radio, uh, different ads. There's different things that you can do uh, even through the COVID to keep our community uh, 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 understanding about the things that they can do concerning fire prevention. Um, and so I think that, you know, for consideration to think of other ways that you can do to keep the community engaged and informed. Thank mm -hmm. you. No, I agree. Thank you, uh, Council Member Harris. Thank you, um, Chair uh, Malik Evans. Um, Chief, Chief Jackson, thank you so much um, for being here today and answering our questions. I'd just thank like you. to piggyback off of um, uh, Council Member Lightfoot's questions in regards to trunk system, the radio trunk system. I'd just like to make sure that when you guys submit your information, I'd like to know, are you guys purchasing the trunk radio system that was initially um, presented or is this something different, a new trunk system? Or I know there was so much pushback on the current system or the system that the county had selected. Um, right. So, you know, if you could just make sure that information is included. Yeah, the, the, the system that the county selected is still the same system. Uh, what we have to purchase is radios to work on that system and we are in 
we have started that process of purchasing radios and until we have a full complement, we'll continue to purchase those radios. They have been included in our CIP. So we will be able to purchase the radios that need it to go on to the system that the county has implemented. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I like to uh, jump to uh, page 10-3 in, in the budget booklet where it talks about the uh, 2016 program to prepare communities for complex coordinated terrorist attacks. And it looks like the loss, there was like a, a loss of funding for that. And could you explain to me, what does that represent? So it's, it's definitely not a loss of funding. Uh, Lieutenant Rem Renner, are you on the, the line? I can have him explain exactly why that is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, right. Yes, I am, Chief. So Councilwoman, the funding you see, the decrease in that funding is actually money that we've already spent out of that grant line. It was spent during the 1920 budget year. Okay. Could you explain to me a little bit more what, what does that um, grant cover? Um, I'm, I just need a little education on it. So that grant is a multi-agency grant between New York State, Mineral County, which includes the Mineral County Sheriff's Office, Mineral County Office of Emergency Management, Mineral County Fire Bureau, along with the Rochester Police Department and Rochester Fire Department to basically provide for funding for exercises, uh, training, and other events for the community's response to aggressive deadly behavior events. Um, is, is, is there a reason why we didn't get funding for this upcoming year? I mean, is that something that's not um, renewable? Do we have to reapply? This was a one-time offering from FEMA for this uh, grant period. Uh, we actually try to apply as a city and a county as a separate to FEMA. However, uh, due to outside influences, we end up partnering with New York State to uh, provide for this. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to stay on that same page going down to the State Homeland Security Program grants and I saw there was a change as well. Um, if you could uh, at least explain the chief could you explain the net change there um regarding the 10-7 there so i'm going to let jamie uh lieutenant renner uh discuss that he oversees our those two grants okay he can thank give you, you a better explanation so i'll let him lieutenant renner thank you chief uh councilman that is regarding uh training that we provided on uh, last budget year again for I believe it was some elevator emergencies along with uh, technical rescue training. Okay. Um, I, I like to also ask, I guess this, I guess could be an answer for I me, mean, a question for you, um, Firefighter Renner or Chief Jackson. I'd like to know what is the administration plan for upcoming, you know, applicate, applying to different grants to supplement, to help the fire department with things like um, staffing, I know there's some some homeland security grants, additional grants that the administration can apply for. There's also grants for staffing that you can um, apply for, which is called the safer grants. And I was wondering, you know, what are your plans for, you know, trying to uh, apply for those grants to help out with with staffing? So, so I'll, well, for the AFG grant, which is the, the staff staffer staffing grant. We generally don't apply for that because what they require is for us to put in a portion of the money. So if you apply, you know, Buffalo applied and I think they agreed to give 40% of the salaries. So we end up increasing our budget by uh, adding and you have to add to the staffing that is already existing. So if we added 10 firefighters, they would pay for six, we'd have to pay for four or three, depending on what the grant required. So generally we don't apply for the safer grants because of that, because there's a, a, a cost to applying for them. Uh, what Buffalo did was they applied for 50 firefighters. They will pay, the, the safer grant will pay for three years, the city will pay for two years, but that's in, in addition to the staffing that they already have. And that's one reason why we don't pursue that type of grant. Because it, it, Is it because it locks us into? I mean, I'm does, just trying to- it, it does lock you into putting in money into the pot to pay for those firefighters. Is it a certain time frame that it locks you into? Like, does it mean that you have to be locked into like for three years, a minimum of three years? 
Well, or... well, it depends on on how many years you want to apply for. You could do five years. You could do three years. Yeah, it does lock you into those years to put money into the system to be able to apply for that. And it has to be in addition to what you already have on the books. So you're adding to your firefighter uh, numbers, but you know it's an addition to what you already have. Okay. Well, thank you. I think you guys did a great job um, with you know making some changes with the budget constraints that we've had for the city. I just wanted to also ask my final question as to, have you guys considered um, proposing buyouts for retirees and you know, maybe not for this budget year, but planning for next budget year because of the different challenges that we're facing for but for the budget upcoming. So I would um we we looked at that as an option, council member, and it was not economically feasible um at this point in time. Um we've looked at that a couple of times. I think that it hasn't been since 2013 or to actually 2012 or 2011 that um, the city offered a buyout and it just wasn't something that would save a lot of money. Um, so we're not looking at that at this time. Okay, thank you. That concludes council my member, question. Council uh, Member Ortiz, oh, was that the last one? Yeah. Anything else, Council Member Harris? I'm all set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, council Member Ortiz and then President Scott. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I apologize. I missed a little bit of the conversation about the recruit class. Obviously, I see that on there and understand. Um, but just really quick, the um, because the exam was on December, the newest class that was hired in January, none of those names are from that particular list, correct? Right, right. So the, the people that are in the class now are from the previous list. So, so, and that one was from four years ago? Correct. Okay. All right. And I, I heard you say that uh, we were going to try to do some engagement with the, the newest list that we have. Um, I apologize if I missed it. Can you please just, again, uh, tell us what specifically we might be doing to engage those folks? Again, I apologize. I missed it. That's okay. Um, so we, we, we started <laughs> out with the letter to all of our people that were eligible for the physical exam and anybody that had taken the test. And we are posting, in that letter, we stated that we are posting things on our website that they can do to stay engaged uh, at this time. And as we, you go, you know, as we move along, we can come up with more ideas on how we can keep them engaged. You know, I know that when people are on these lists and time goes by, we tend to lose uh, participants or people that have taken the test. Uh, our candidates get a little edgy and they go out and they start looking for other, other employment. Um, we, we're trying to keep them engaged. I don't know how much we can keep them engaged as far as, you know, them going on. If they don't have a job right now, they're going to go out and look for other jobs. But we can actually send out material on, you know, physical fitness. We have our physical fitness company who can also uh, reach out to them and give them things that they can do. We can send out informational pamphlets, you know, telling them how they can keep up their academic levels, books they can read and things like that. You know, that's okay. what we can do to keep them engaged at this point. So do we not anticipate that the new applicant tracking system will help us to do perhaps electronic outreach on a, on a specific interval or I guess I'm just trying to figure out one letter. So I'm with you. I think there are other things that we need to do mm -hmm. in order to keep them engaged. So. Um, Again, I don't need the answer specifically at this moment, but um, if we can think about uh, ways to ensure that we capture their contact information electronically in terms like emails and that kinds of things that we may be able to send out blasts on a you know specific interval to check right. in with folks, give them an update where we might be, so on and so forth, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, we, we um, do use emails. I know HR, we have to go through HR because they have all of the email information, but in the past we have used emails to stay in contact with people, but not everybody has an email. So yeah. we, we also send out letters to make sure that we cover everybody, so. All right, well, texting, that's our next, our, our, our next edition then. <laughs> you know, apps, apps um, are, especially with, you know, this electronic uh, age that we're in, you know, I think apps are gonna become more popular and we'll probably engage that sometime in the future also. Right, so I also, I have a question on, uh, Chief, your numbers, 
have I must be the most consistent numbers that I've ever seen in terms of the amount of people that are uniform and civilian. I mean, these numbers like are exactly the same pretty much every single year. Um, how you're able to do that? Um, I am. I'm curious in terms of you know I. The question was about the buyouts, but my question is, how many do we have scheduled to retire this coming fiscal? And is the 30 or so recruit class enough to cover that? So unfortunately, you know, somebody can tell me tomorrow that they're retiring next week. You know, it's there's no requirement that they have to give us any period of time, uh, any advance time as to when they're going to retire. So it's more of a projection. You know, we work with our okay budget analyst to try and predict that. Uh, this year, we were a little bit off. We thought we'd have more retirements because we had a number of uh, classes that were coming to 30 years, 32 years, uh, 25 years. And so we thought we'd see a heavier, heavier retirement rate. Unfortunately, we didn't get that. So, you know, that's why we have the overhire that we have right now. We try, again, we try to predict and that's how we determine how many people we're gonna put in a class and you know how big our recruit classes will be you know how big we want to recruit uh the candidates on the list you know do we go down 100 people do we go down 200 people that's all based on what budget projects for uh, a retirement rate so i wish i knew exactly how many people were going to retire in the next year but i just don't it's just hard to predict right think, no understood but your projection basically based on what you said then you project at least 30 people to retire this year hence the 30 plus or so for the recruitment. you know uh is sarah on the line i think we yep i'm here i'm um, 25 we're projecting 25 we projected for this cup okay Project Thank you. And then um, one other uh, question I have on this area is with everything going on and obviously the um, uh, halt, if you will, on recruits, what happens with our pathways to safety students that graduate from the program specifically for fire? So that program is actually, when I mean, it was originally designed for a 24 month uh, period. So they can actually stay in that program for 24 months. So we'll probably keep them an additional time and well, we will keep them for an additional time and we'll have them do more training, more uh, college classes, more hands-on training that will prepare them for the class. So hopefully they'll be more ready when we do have a class. And then hopefully we should have another group that will come in. It's gonna give us a larger pool that we have to manage, but I think we'll be okay managing that, especially since we're not having recruit, uh, uh, a recruit class in January. So what we can do is we can add some of our personnel to help manage that group. So we're still planning on having our tra trainees trans transition into the program. And we still plan on having the program. They won't be cast aside. We're going to keep them and keep them in the program. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, President Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, on page 10-3, 10, 10 mm -hmm. we have an increase of $264,700 for uh, medical expenses. What are medical expenses and why would you expect an increase of that level? So, you know, firefighting is a pretty dangerous job. <laughs> People get hurt and, and we have to take care of those folks when they, when they do get hurt. Uh, Unfortunately, as we all know, medical costs are rising in the United States constantly. And, and to meet that demand, we had to add more money to that medical line to cover you know, injuries and, and taking care of the folks who have been injured, long-term disabilities, all those things that we have on the books that we are obligated to take care of. So we added more money to that line because last year we noticed that we were kind of stretching that medical line it, it wasn't uh we didn't have enough funding we were pretty close to not having enough funding but we added money to that line just because costs are just increasing so much i, I don't recall seeing that as a as a line in the operating budget for the other departments um chris i don't see that in i don't think it's in rpd or des or any of those it's usually in the in the um What's that other pot of money? Not undistributed. 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 Yeah. yeah, undistributed. Right. So this is not um, uh, this is not general um, health care. 
coverage for um, firefighters and, and this and the long-term disability as well is actually funded in out of undistributed as well. This is um, you know fire medical case management expenses um, that are in the in the fire operating budget. And is there a similar line in RPD? Um, yes, there is. Okay. Okay, and the and Chief, you think that number is is on target because what? Where'd you get that number from? So, so I I didn't calculate that number, but. Uh, I know that they look at uh, such things as workman's comp uh, and the reimbursement rates for uh, medical that we do every year. So, you know, they that's more calculated by the things that, um, that the, 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 the metrics we use to measure what medical should cost, basically, so. And Council President, what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll um, make sure that we give you a list of what's included in that number. So you have that and how they calculated it. I think that'll okay. be better for us to right. give you an accurate, yeah. um, detailed list of what's included in that number. So we'll get that back to you. Thank you for that. Um, on page, <laughs> on page 10-11, Okay. And talk about timeliness, because I'm going to ask you the question about CPR sort of resuscitation, right? So <laughs> we need that because one of our colleagues says she has no question. So we, we're going to need to be resuscitated. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to space it out. Oh. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now I believe this, the number, this, this really extreme jump. Is this from the certification has to be done like every three years and this is like the third so, year or something like that? So CPR is every other year. Mm -hmm. And you know, so every other year there's a larger number that we have to uh, recertify. And then for like EMTs, it's every third year. So you're gonna see those numbers vary from year to year because of those factors. So uh, when you look at that, the second year, uh, this, this is a CPR year where we have to recertify all our members. Um, so you, you, you'll see a large increase. Next year, you'll see a very low number because it'll be a small amount. And then the following year, it'll be large again. So every other year, that number is gonna change. Okay. Um, I didn't find the, 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 the category or the KPI that would tell me um, in terms of the number of responses related to heroin overdoses. And I know that we had had conversations about this um, last year, probably the year before even, mm -hmm. and the concern about the significant impact on RFD because of the increase in heroin overdoses. What is the status of that situation as, as it relates to RFD? So, so before COVID, our, our heroin overdoses were actually dropping. When COVID hit, all of a sudden we saw a spike and we're seeing a spike in the number of overdoses again. Uh, I, I can't use any reasoning as to why, it's just that when COVID hit, all of a sudden our numbers started going back up again. I don't know if that's because of depression from people being home or what, but you know we did see a, an, an increase during COVID. Uh, prior to that, we had saw a drop and we were actually working with uh, you know, the regional, Rochester Regional Health to help mitigate the heroin problem. And I think we had some great ideas and programs that we were, gonna, we were gonna put in place to help reduce that. And basically when COVID hit, everything came to a halt, but we do have some programs, hopefully when things open back up that we wanna implement to try and reduce the number of heroin overdoses, including getting people help and getting people into programs. So once, once we're back to whatever the new normal is, then we'll start uh, working on with those uh, agencies to and some of our other community partners to put that back in place. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Council Member Gruber, you had some questions? 
I do. I fear that the, the background noise is going to be bad because there's a, a lawn being mowed right next to me. Is, is it bad? I can't even hear it. Okay, that's great. I'll just have to scream a little louder. Um, first, Chief, can I just get a, an update on the uh, on the boat on the fire boat implementation and how that's going to look and, and what the staffing for that's going to look like? Absolutely. I have Lieutenant Lanthier, who is the head of that committee, on. Uh, I mean, Deputy Chief Lanthier, could you uh, give us an update on that? Uh, absolutely. Um, good afternoon. So. Um, as part of our uh, budget this year, we were due to have an implementation plan. Uh, and you'll see in the budget a $47,000 number uh, for that. Um, so the, and that's basically to fund the implementation plan that is basically focused on, uh, on training, equipment, fuel in the first year, uh, the storage of the boat, maintenance of the boat, and um, uh, basically this getting the boat uh, from startup into, uh, into operations. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, we're working with uh, uh, city real estate to secure a location um, down on Petten Street. Um, so from there, we're just kind of plugging along and uh, getting things done. Okay, um, a couple other follow-up questions. Um, I noticed there's a line for about $110,000 in uh, cleaning and law, or maybe it's an additional uh, for cleaning and laundry increases. And um, something I've always, uh, I've always wondered ever since Mayor Warren first brought uh, the Democracy Collaborative here is the opportunity to do uh, some work around co-ops when it comes to laundry. It seems like a lot of extra dollars for cleaning and laundry. Who, who does that work right now? So that is actually specialized cleaning and laundering of turnout gear. Uh, turnout gear, uh, when it's used at a fire, is actually subjected to a lot of toxins and carcinogens. So trying to clean that isn't something as simple as throwing it in a regular wash machine. So we have to send that out to a, a specialized company that actually cleans our, our turnout gear. And because cancer has become so prevalent amongst firefighters, we have instituted a system where they can actually clean their gear after every fire, which is what the National Fire Protection Agency recommends. So we're sending our gear in more often to have it clean so to protect our firefighters. The, the unfortunate part of firefighting is you're, you're subjected to these carcinogens that off gas a lot. And if we don't get them clean, you know, you can expose your family, you can expose your fellow firefighters, it can sit in a firehouse and off gas those carcinogens and create cancerous situations. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to clean it more often so to minimize the uh, carcinogens and toxins that get on our gear when we go to fires and other situations where we're uh, dealing with uh, toxic materials. And that's why, you know, that's why we had to increase it because the NFPA has recommended that every time a firefighter goes to a fire, that they clean that gear after. And, you know, it was difficult at one point to implement that because firefighters wear their gear as a badge of honor. And we had to kind of change that mentality so that people started cleaning the gear more often. So that's why we have an increase in the amount of money spent on uh, cleaning and laundering. All right, thank you. Just two more quick questions. Um, you mentioned FEMA before. Is there uh, an opportunity? Maybe this is directed towards uh, Chris, but is there an opportunity to be submitting for FEMA for some of the work RFD has done over the last three months? Well, we are we are submitting for that. We do have some grants and some Department of Justice things that we're applying for right now. The period has just opened open for submission, and we are submitting for those things. Unfortunately, they take a couple of months before you find out if they're accepted and you are given the grant, but we are submitting for all of those grants for any of the, any money we can get and any reimbursements we can get because of the COVID situation. So our, our people are working on those grants currently. Thank you. And my last question. We're also working for, we're also going through FEMA to try to get some reimbursement uh, and started that process as well. Right. Wonderful. My last question, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Council Member Ortiz had said before, that the level of consistency is incredible for the fire department, not just with staffing. Also, if you look at the KPIs from the number of calls uh, of calls to each uh, 
house, firehouse. It's it's unbelievable how how consistent and in some ways predictable it seems, which I think is in some ways is um, maybe what you were, uh, maybe what led to some of the dynamic staffing conversations last year. Uh, I, I am wondering, um, I, obviously we have not had to call in dynamic staffing since the new classes, which is wonderful, but I am wondering um, what kind of updates there have been on the, the work related to, that, to, to dynamic staffing, if in fact you needed to use that again. Well, we didn't use dynamic staffing in the last and uh, part of the year. Um, basically, you know, the mayor uh, uh, allowed us to uh, not use it. And I think at the end of this year, we will be made whole by budget and that money will be re-implemented. We didn't put it in next year's budget. There is no dynamic staffing. We do want to maintain the dynamic staffing model in case of something catastrophic happening to our department. If we were to lose 100 firefighters from COVID and we had to quarantine them, you know, we could use uh, dynamic staffing. We could implement something like that, but we will only use it in the next budget year, at least for emergency staffing or anything like that. We, so, yeah, you know, our runs are pretty consistent. Uh, we definitely have uh, companies that are doing more runs than they've done in the past. But it, it, the dynamic staffing model is not expected to be used unless it's a catastrophic situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice President Lightfoot and then Councilmember Peel. Uh, I defer to Councilmember Peel, sir. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Peel. Um, yeah, in, re in regards to the uh, pretty consistent staffing there, um, once we get our, our boat, though, how are we going to staff that? Okay, so. We operate a boat currently. We plan on using the same operating model that we have right now. So we have a company that is assigned to the boat. If uh, a boat is needed, that company drives to the lock, to the dock and they man the boat. Uh, we also have boats that we implement uh, through our rescue team. Got the other parents, right? So, uh, yeah, okay. We have a uh, right. operational right. model that right. doesn't require any additional manpower to operate the boat. We have a boat, it's a Boston whaler that we operate right now. So what we'll do is we'll use the same system we use right now. Okay, so, and they come from the Shalott firehouse, correct? That is correct. And as you know, we do backfill that firehouse whenever that company is deployed. Okay, very good. And the second question is the special ops training um, looks like we have a decrease or in a drills, a decrease. Um, will we be having more drills pertaining to uh, things like riots when fires are being put all over the place? Or is that, I mean, I see a decrease of about eight in the past two years. So what do you see for special drills and pertaining to riots and such? So I'll let Lieutenant Renner talk about that in a minute, but you know, anytime you have civil unrest, we, we're, we're all trained, all our command staff is trained in how to deal with the civil unrest and, and how to manage that type of incident. As far as the drills are concerned, you know, it takes money to put on a drill. We have to take people out of service. We have to bring in other uh, resources. So, you know, I can let uh, Lieutenant Renner talk about the drills and, and, and what, how he plans them and why there's a small decrease in them. Lieutenant Renner. Council member, so the special ops drills that are listed in the budget are regarding special drill, special ops drills that our current specialty teams deal with. So like trench, confined space, building collapse, hazmat, where we're actually going out refining our skills. Um, as the landscape changes in regards to the current riots and other events happening in the city, uh, we can definitely take a look at that and uh, provide extra training as needed. Okay, and how do you feel your 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 department was prepared for these past week's events? How do you feel about it? I think I think we were well prepared. Uh, you know, we, we were prepared to up staff, you know, our people, we had three people at the e, uh, ECD, we had uh, one person down, our executive deputy chief was down with RPD watching cameras making sure that when we sent in uh, companies that we were, if it was a hot spot or it was a danger zone, we were sending in escorts from RPD 
So I think we were well prepared to handle it. The one truck that did uh, was attacked, you know, that everyone saw uh, was kind of a, a situation that just couldn't be avoided. They, they drove into the situation not knowing what they were driving into. And it was early on in the event. But once we got a handle on what was going on, we were able to prevent any further uh, attacks on the fire trucks or any of our personnel. And one last question, how how do you feel your uh, your systems integrate with the RPD? Uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean by integrate. We, we do work well with them. We're in constant contact with them. One of the reasons why we have our personnel at ECD is that it's easier for us to uh, communicate to them anything that's going on and for them to communicate to us what's going on. So anytime we have a, a second alarm or any events like we had Saturday night, we send uh, personnel to the ECD to coordinate that. So that if we have, do have any issue with say, you know, some unrest or people being unruly or aggressive, we can send somebody out, you know, ask for RPD help. Or, or escorts to uh, mitigate the situation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, council member, uh, invite Mr. Council member, Vice President Lightfoot, you will have the last word, sir, if you got, a, if you got the uh, last question. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir, um, uh, Chairman Evans. I just wanna follow back up on uh, Councilman Peel's question and the answer from the chief uh, about the, the, um, the one engine that was kind of on the siege. Uh, you said that there was a plan in place. I don't have to see it now, but could you get us a copy of that plan that was in place for the weekend, please? Yep. Thank you. I will do that. Thank you. And um, thank you, Chief, and your team for all that you do to keep all of us safe. It's greatly sure. appreciated, particularly during these times. Um, and I want to thank you and your team for um, joining us um, for this budget hearing. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. And we're always happy. If anybody has any further questions, please let us know and we'll get you an answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's take a um, five minute break. Um, feel free to get up, stretch, and then we will uh, get busy on um, the dry ice budget. Thanks. Ray, congratulations, man. Thank you, sir. Hi, Team Drives. How y'all doing? Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Great, Thank you. Thank you.
We'll get started in about one minute. Good to see you. I feel I feel like right now we're like C-SPAN, you know, we're we're <laughs> we're just sort of yep, we are the in between of meetings, just waiting for uh, for it to start. Yeah, it's a C-SPAN, man. Minus the music, we got to have the music in between. You know, that C-SPAN always has that music. Okay, it is uh, now two forty-five um, on the dot. Uh, we, we're now going to move to the budget hearing for uh, DRIES. I want to uh, welcome Commissioner Dr. Lyman Torres and her team. Uh, Commissioner Torres, if you want to let us know who you have with you, and then we'll get right into um, we'll get right into questioning uh, for time's sake. So, um, Dr. Torres. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to introduce the team uh, that's here. Uh, Christina Heiligenthaler, who oversees our budget, data, and capital projects. Uh, Mai Ho, uh, who oversees our personnel and marketing. Jim Farr, who is the director of the public market, you all know well, and just this past weekend celebrated his 43rd year of service to the city of Rochester. Um, Eric Rose, who is the director of Com community athletics. We have Kendra Hale LeBoy, who oversees the R Centers. Sarah Scott, who is uh, oversees our park activation, camps, and special programs. John Pacone, uh, who is the manager of athletics and aquatics. Ray Mayalees, who's long been overseeing our Pathways to Peace program. And Jamila Crossdale, who is the manager of youth employment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam President, um, did you have um, questions? Uh, you're muted, Madam President. Madam President, you're, you're muted, I think. Uh, am, I, am I there, there yet? Okay, now you're, there. Now, now you're there, Madam President. Now we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to start my comments with sort of like a preamble. <laughs> um, I, I have in, in the 11 years I've been on city council, I've been very careful not to engage in administrative stuff. I tried to stay in my lane having been the former commissioner of Parks, Recreation, and Human Services, I didn't even want to be on the committee that oversaw that when I came on council. I've been really careful about that. Uh, this, this year, though, I, I feel like I just had a relapse because I looked at the budget and it really, really disturbed me. And the comments that I have, I hope that you all recognize they're, they're not personal, but they're serious. I'm not taking shots at anybody, but I just want to share with you 
what, what I reacted to when I looked at the budget. Um, for, for example, there, there's, not, there's only one title, one recreation title in all of the Department of Recreation and Youth Services. And that one title is in, is in administration. That it's just odd. There's, and I looked at the new organization char charts. There, the new configuration has no on-site supervision. It's got a CCM that's supposed to be supervising three separate sites apparently. And knowing that there's nobody on site consistently at these facilities, which can be very challenging and challenging is a generous word. Um, the elimination, and I'll tell you something that I almost take offense at, and maybe it wasn't intended that way, but last year I was concerned about the way some of the titles are being treated and I successfully argued for red circling. Well, this year those titles just got eliminated. They were abolished. So that's almost an affront. Um, in the, um, the, the positions that were moved around or changed around or read whatever you want to call them, the thing that seems to be unfeeling almost is that there are, are employees who are within arm's reach of retirement whose jobs have been, have been down, uh, downgraded salary-wise. And since you receive your, your retirement is based on your highest last three years, that could have significant and permanent impacts on, on their livelihood. And I know that we, you know, we can't control all of that, but I was immediately reminded of what had happened with our beloved president recently who had the National Guard, not the National Guard, I forget what army, what uh, branch of service it was, had them withdrawn for June 24th, which was one day shy of the, those contingents being able to benefit from those, uh, the additional benefits that would have come to them from being your 90 days. It's that kind of thing that's unthinking. And I, I don't know whether it was an accident or, or what, but we've done this uh, among employees who are long-term employees and there's some significant retirement implications. My other and final comment because uh, is that, you, you know, we, we worked for years in recreation to develop career ladders primarily because recreation positions are not in a department that's chartered and the titles in that department are not transferable across to other departments. So your job is either in that department or you don't have a job. So we work to schedule to develop career ladders. Those rungs were basically cut from beneath the people that were standing on them. So I just wanted to, I just really felt the need to, to uh, share that with you. And I recognize that we were in some really serious budgetary waters, but we're gonna have an opportunity to look across the board to see where there are other opportunities to bring in resources to drive so that they don't have to undergo such draconian measures. So with that, I'll yield, thank you, Chairman. Evans. Thank you. Um, so, Council um, Member um, Patterson. Madam President, oh, I'll start uh, off. Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll start off and then I'll turn it over to Commissioner Torres to talk about the vision and direction. And I think that um, you made some very great points about direction and changes. Um, as you um, know, you know, Dries and the Department of Youth and Recreation has uh, taking on res different responsibility that they've changed over time. The focus has really changed over time. And I think that, you know, sometimes we try to change, but stay the same. And in this instance, um, understanding the commissioner's vision for the department and the things that they needed to tackle, there were some uh, real issues. Um, I do recognize that upward mobility and um, if there's unintended consequences that may come of this, 
then we will definitely go back and look at that. Um, I know that I had a discussion with the budget director earlier, um, and so I can't give you an answer on that today to see what those unintended consequences for some of the changes that we're proposing will be. Uh, we made significant investments in the Department of Youth and Recreation over the last uh, couple years um, because we recognize that youth engagement is so important to the future. Um, this past year, the department did a, um, a, a, a recreation-wide uh, survey where they actually spoke to youth and um, had them basically tell us what it is that they're looking for. And, um, and one of the things is that they wanted more one-on-one -on -one or direct engagement. And because of the way we were structured, that was not something that really could happen um, given the way that um, the, the organization was designed. And so we take your leadership, your understanding and your history um, into account. And we know that you have the best interest for not just the drives department but for the entire city of Rochester. But I just wanna give the commissioner an opportunity to really talk to you about the vision and the reason why uh, these changes are being made. And we also recognize, as we said earlier about human resources, the upward mobility, people being able to go from one position and see themselves climbing up the ladder um, in a department is very important as well. And you know that also is being taken into account as we look at the changes in the department that are being proposed. And I'll let the commissioner talk about that as well. Commissioner. Commissioner. Yes, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, President Scott. The, the vision for DRIES and its changes is to increase youth engagement. Uh, the youth leadership, as the mayor said, conducted a community desire survey and focus groups, and the youth spoke about what they wanted. They want open rec, but they also want programs. And they want positive communications with adults. They went on to list their concerns about some of the adults in their surroundings, the, the things that they were exposed to, drug use, cat calling, some of the negative things they experience when they walk around the community. And they wanna have more positive relationships with mentoring adults and adults that can provide that. We have those, those, those wonderful and caring adults that have worked in this department over many decades and continue to work in this department. And the structure that we had in place worked well at the time it was developed and it worked well some, for some time after that. But for today and, and tomorrow, we needed to look at rebuilding the career ladder in a way that provides upward mobility without taking the most experienced staff further away from working with the youth. The youth have asked for them and they need them. We, we do also have a, commu a commitment to ensuring that our staff reflect the community and the youth that they serve. And as the mayor mentioned, these, the state level developed civil service exams continue to be a barrier for upward mobility for DRIES and DRIES roles need to stay and be accessible career opportunities. So I will be working with the HR team to develop local exams that be, can be best connected to the work we do here and therefore be more achievable. So, and we'll continue to measure the success of this vision by the youth and community feedback. Um, the youth have been positioned to take the lead and the helm in monitoring what matters most to them and their peers. And they've taken their charge very seriously and are doing an outstanding job. They will have the opportunity to direct funding we have for programs and services. And you see that in this budget under what's called youth directed initiatives. Families have spoken about the, regarding the kind of amenities and programs they want to use, and you have invested in facility improvements that help meet those needs. We, we continue to do that with a new registration system, more engaging staff um, activities with less office obligations. I do understand that that change is difficult. Uh, it has been identified by leaders who've been here many decades that change has been becoming more necessary, but the difficulty of that change has slowed it down. The youth has, have asked us to demonstrate 
the, the courage that it takes to make the changes needed. Um, and, and I know that, you know, we did some changes last year, but to say that all of it could have been done at once was not our reality. We needed to lead, lay the foundation for the changes for the frontline staff. And now we need to focus on the rest of the, the pieces of that vision. And I do, again, just, just to say, I have, we have heard you, I have heard you, and we'll be, you know, continuing to take your feedback, your questions and concerns into consideration. Thank you. Um, let me get, go to uh, Council Member Patterson. Thank you. Um, Mayor Warren, Commissioner Torres, no one doubts your commitment to the youth of Rochester. No one doubts your compassion for the employees of the city of Rochester. But it is very challenging, as, as Council President Scott said, for us to not notice and not be deeply concerned when you eliminate 10 recreation center director positions, which are the pinnacle of that career ladder for the folks who are, quite honestly, represented by by unions in our community, and you replace those 10 positions with four positions that are outside of union representation. We've heard from the local and these individuals, and their statement to us is, is that this appears to be a slap in the face. This appears to be the effect of taking an extension ladder and throwing half the ladder away and saying, yeah, see, we still got a career ladder. You just can't get there. So there's, I'm hoping that there's more room for conversation in this process before we get to the end of it. But you know, if it's a problem with the people doing the work as the work is redesigned, okay. But, but when you're hearing about people who are three years and less from retirement, who may well be looking at a $20,000 cut in pay that will have an impact on them for the remainder of their life. We have an obligation to the children. We all admit that. But you also have an obligation to your people. You know, the, the people who have, who have who've been here, who've, who've given that blood, sweat, and tears. You know, we, we sing praises for James Farr, who's been here longer than most members of council have been alive. Um, <laughs> we, we sing praises for other members uh, who work for the city, who, who've been on here for 40 plus years, and we commend them for that. You know, and, and they can retire anytime they want. They're here because they love the work. Great. But we, but we got other folks who've, who've given that same quality, blood, sweat, and tears, they're looking to retire. It, retirement in and of itself is a cut in wages, which is a difficult time. And, and they're looking at an even greater cut in wages currently that will lead to a, a, a greater cut in wages farther down the line. So, you know, as, as, as you're redesigning, and I'm not saying that, that you haven't given it consideration, but I guess the challenge is, can you, can you take a minute, can you look at it again? Because it's, it's budgets, but it's also people. And it, it's also a message to the staff below them. The message to the staff below them is, look, if they're gonna cut out the top rung, why are you sitting here? You know, we had a company, you know, commissioner and I had a conversation about, about one of the youth workers before this all started. And I was going, yeah, I, I'm gonna work to try and get him over here. She's like, well, what about the children? I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, okay. But the message now is, yeah, well, what about the children if you ain't going to take care of the staff? You know, these, these staff develop relationships with people over decades. They don't just serve the kid in the rec center today. They serve that parent coming back to the rec center with their kid tomorrow. So, you know, I'll, I'll sit back and listen. So I'll, I'll start off and I'll let the commissioner um, chime in. And so as I, as I explained to the council president, you know, we will look at the unintended consequences. And so I'll assure you that um, those issues that you raised will be looked at and we'll get back to council on uh, ways that we can possibly address that. Um, I do know that um, one of the, you know, things that the commissioner had 
originally put into the budget was six actual director positions. Um, and that's something that we will go back and look at with the, the budget director uh, to, to see if that's an opportunity. Um, we definitely have to be careful with, um, with implications of having different people um, in the same title, having a different uh, bracket in, in pay scale because that's an issue um, for us as it pertains to civil service. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of different factors that are uh, to be considered as we move forward um, on this. And we can assure you that we will look at the unintended consequences. As it pertains to um, people being removed from working directly with children, I think that what we have to understand is that basically um, in 2018, uh, we have five levels of, of basic management in um, the recreation department. So you had a uh, deputy commissioner, you had area coordinators, you had center director, senior rec supervisor and rec supervisor. None of those positions were to work directly with kids. And so you have five levels of management, but the, the people that work directly with the kids are were just recreation members. And so in 2019, that changed to be, you know, five director, 0.5 director, assistant director, area coordinator, two area coordinators, 10 city center directors, and rec supervisors. You still have 4.5 levels of management and not necessarily their role wasn't to work directly with children. And so now what we're looking at and what the children have asked for is to have people that work directly with them. And that's what the training and quality coordinators will be doing. Um, and then you'll have this, the community center managers as well as directors. So I think that one of the things that the commissioner needs to do when we can do this in writing is provide those job descriptions to you so that you understand exactly what those individuals were doing and the reason why the change is necessary based on what the children have been telling us um, from that survey. And, I, and I'm, I don't think, well, I'll speak for myself. And I don't have any problem at all with any redesign of Rise that has more, more adults working with kids. That's, that's not the issue. Uh, but it, as we're, we're making these redesigns, you know, I would just ask that you keep in mind that you have people who have made a commitment to working in our rec centers with our children, effectively raising generations of children, teaching kids, yes, ma'am, no, sir, um, how to behave, how to act, how to get along with folks, doing that hard work that a lot of folks don't do, effectively being parents um, out here for an awful lot of children. And that is a significant and serious commitment that they have made. And I'm not opposed to change, but any change that hurts them hurts those kids too. And I would just ask you to keep that in mind. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%, Council Member Patterson. Before I go to the next council member, just, just my, a, a quick question. Um, and, I, and I'm a rec center person. I tell people all the time, I owe my career um, to, to recreation because I started as a 16 year old as a, as a youth worker and then a recreation clerical aide. I remember working with John, John Pacone, uh, Loretta Scott was, was commissioner when I was there. But one of the things that I saw as a young person, as a 16 year old is, I could look at the career ladder and see people in position where they started as a youth working and then they were um went to college someone went to brockport got got the got got degrees in recreation and then they and then they climbed the ladder what how does that look now for a 16 year old as a youth worker now um commissioner can, can they still um climb that ladder because it looks like and you correct me if i'm wrong it looks like now with the changes, th there may be positions that are eliminated that, that takes that ladder away from them. Is, is that accurate or is that not accurate? Um, my, 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 my characterization or what does that look like now? What, what will that look like for, for a 16 year old that starts as a youth worker that may want a career in recreation? They don't want to do anything else. They want to stay in recreation because they want to work with young people. What would that look like? Thank you on mute commissioner. 
Sorry about that. Yeah. Right now, what we have in this budget is we have a design that has a youth development specialist, that's so the education specialist and sports and fitness specialist that are is that that's one full time level. That's the full time um, entry level. Although there are other levels that a youth worker would look to achieve before even achieving that that full time um, status. Beyond that, there is um, at this time a training and quality coordinator level that, that again, as the mayor mentioned, that can provide those job descriptions to, to further clarify how they all link together and, and what role it's playing in the R centers. But it's an opportunity for um, upward mobility, staying in the centers um, and, and having some touch points with youth, but also being in, in an upward um, mobility um, framework. Then there's the community center manager. What the next phase of this is in this in this budget that you see here, there's also a bracket increase that has been applied to the specialist positions, which used to be called rec leaders. And so the idea is that there can be a further professionalization uh, for people who have more experience and who are more seasoned in those specialist roles. And the next phase of that is to establish a senior youth development specialist, a senior education specialist, and a senior sports and fitness specialist at a higher bracket. And their job wouldn't remove them from being with the youth, but it would allow them to use the skills and experience that they have gained to develop programs, to, to um, really kind of create and shape the work that the other specialists would be doing with the youth as well. So there is, go there is an opportunity, there is a career ladder uh, vision. Um, all of that is understood and, and is actually built into the plan. It's just not, not all of the positions are visible in this current year's budget. As the mayor described, um, one of those, um, one of those uh, positions that, or two of them, I'm sorry, that we submitted for community center managers wasn't able to be funded um, after our, our um, you know, COVID impact resubmittal of our budget. But so the intention was there to have even more of those positions. So I think what um, and we, what you also sh should know is that there is a, you know, coordinator of community um, athletics as well, that some people have seen themselves going in, not, um, you know, not going in just straight up a vertical direction within the R centers, but saying, hey, I'm really interested in the sports aspect, um, the athletics and aquatics. Are there are there opportunities um, for advancement in that part of the department? So there are um, career ladder opportunities in this current budget, and there's a design to have an, a, an additional level um, in a subsequent budget where those can be funded. Okay, C C Councilmember Gruber, you said you wanted to add something to, to this conversation. Yeah, that's good to know that, um, you know, this change from 10 center directors to four, I think they're called community center directors um, that you just referenced, I think the mayor referenced before the, the initial ask was to have six of them. And part of, part of what I want to bring to the table is that, you know, I, I think the most important thing here is <clears throat> how many hours are we able to keep our centers open with good programming in every part of the city? And so when I looked at the, the DRIES budget, one of the things that really concerned me was some of the changes to, um, to Roxy Sinclair, to Humboldt. I'm excited about the fact that we're taking on um, the old SWAN programming in Wilson. But, you know, I guess one of the questions that I would ask is if, if there was an opportunity to be able to, uh, to increase those slots, uh, for the community center managers, would we also be able to add hours and programming at our centers that right now look like they're being diminished significantly? So, so the answer, um, Council Member Gruber, is yes. Um, you know, the the more people that we have to be able to oversee and to be able to um, you know create programming and and ensure that there's programming that can occur, the the more we would be able to do. So the design had six. Um, six in, in the, the design and, and Roxy um, and Humboldt were in that design. Um, and 
you know, th but they are in that design in, in somewhat of a reduced capacity because of a, a reduction in attendance as well. So, um, but they weren't, they're not eliminated in, in the design where we have six community center managers because Humboldt um, is a, a popular summer site. Um, it has attendance has declined in the school year due to school 28 starting its own after school programming. Um, and Roxy has struggled with after school programming, um, but has really served well with older youth doing late night basketball and some other types of um, activities. So we definitely could um, enhance and increase the programming and the, the access to those facilities with additional uh, leadership positions. Well, I, all I can say is I, and I think it sounds like a lot of other people feel the same way. I'm a huge, huge proponent and advocate of there being additional dollars in drives. And I just want to say something that has not been said explicitly yet. We talk a lot about the front lines when we're talking about DES we just got done with, the fire department we just got done with. I have been so fortunate over the last three months in my other capacity at Foodlink to see up close and personal the way that the drive staff and is, is truly the front lines of serving people in this community. I see it every day at the rec centers passing out food. I see it with Ray and the Pathways team at the mass distributions that are being done around the county. And all I can say is that we need to make sure that the, that the good work being done by the R centers, if anything, I think there should be a staff increase in terms of the number of people out there and not a decrease. We have other places in the, in the city's budget where we might have to look at making some swaps because that the, the work you guys do is too vital, especially right now when we don't even know what the shape of schools are going to be next year. And we do know that the R centers are going to be there for people. So I, I can't say that um, strongly enough. And, and I appreciate your vision for the department, Commissioner Lyman Torres. This is not about me challenging your vision. It is me challenging the city of Rochester to continue to put more resources into youth and recreation. Um, um, Vice President Lightfoot, and, and, and so then I'll I, I definitely want to. Oh, you know, go ahead, Madam Mayor. Um, if you look, go to the front of the the budget book. I, I want to point out the the chart, the the graph that is in the front of the budget book that I'll I'll um, that basically shows how much we actually are funding youth and recreation between the city of Rochester and the city school district at the same amount that we're basically funding um, public safety. Um, so I, I just want us to be very clear on, you know, the fact that we are providing a significant amount of resources to children, either through what we provide to the city schools or what we provide in our, um, in our drives department. And so um, I, I will, you can go on to the next question. I thought I had it here. Um, but I definitely want to highlight that so that people understand and that the record is very, very clear about where our focus is because our funding for children is on par with our funding for um, our public safety. And we need to just make sure that that record is reflected and I'll find the, the chart here and make sure that I, I let you guys know that. Mayor, if you would, if you wouldn't mind me just saying, I I, I want to be very clear that I'm not challenging or 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 even beginning to question your commitment to the youth of the city of Rochester. That's not what I'm trying to do here, and I'm grateful that you and I know that uh, VP Lightfoot were very insistent upon having this chart show with the 119 we give to the schools, the total amount we serve the youth. But I'm looking at page 1215 specifically. And when it comes to the Department of Recreation, the Bureau of Recreation, we are cutting the budget pretty significantly. And I, I recognize that we have to make cuts this year. I understand that. But on 1215, we go from um, you know, the actual 2018-19 for Bureau of Recreation at 5.5 million to now down to 4.8 million. And we look at the full-time staff on page 1216, it's 51 and a half full-time last year and it's 47 and a half full-time next year. And that's, that's what I'm referring to. It's not about questioning your administration's commitment to the youth. That's not what I'm trying to do. It is specifically highlighting the roles that the rec centers play right now. And my personal interest, and I think I'm hearing from a lot of my colleagues, their interest in continuing to add dollars and funding to those resources. 
No, Council Member, I, I understand and I definitely um, agree with you. I think that we look at it as a holistic approach and not a separate approach. I think that it's a $500,000 reduction. We've asked all of our um, you know, departments to dig deep, given the situation with COVID, uh, given the situation uh, that the city overall is experiencing. As I said to both President Scott, as well as Council Member um, Patterson, those unintended consequences, I know that the budget director is going to take a, a second look at, but I just wanted to make sure that we weren't looking at this in separate piecemeal because I think that we have to look at the total approach when it comes down to what the city funds for, for youth, youth programs, and that includes the $119.1 million that we provide to the city school district. And so that, that was my point, um, not necessarily that I know that you guys are right now separating out the DRIES department, but I need you to also understand the overall picture when it comes down to what the city funds for children and families in our community. Thank you. Vice President Lightfoot. Okay, hello. So um, I'm glad to hear you guys talking about, I call this my graph, right? Yes, Because I, I fought very, very, very hard it, it, to it, get this graph. called me to make sure I had it in there. <laughs> The light foot chart. We'll call it the light foot chart. Right. You got your own chart name. Uh, it's, 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 it's almost there, but it's not quite right yet. You know, it just doesn't quite curl up all the way, right? So um, well, we took a shot at it. <laughs> my my, and, and I just I just want to first of all I want to say this, uh, Commissioner Torres and your team. I want to commend you first and foremost as essential workers that have been out here under this COVID nineteen, and many of your workers and many of the the individuals that are working in our centers, feeding families, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner. I mean, I, I just, I, I want to acknowledge that. And I want to say, I thank you and your and all of your essential workers and your staff who have been working consistently and have not been able to work from home, have been in harm's way throughout this entire pandemic. And so that should not be overlooked. And uh, I want to make sure that they understand that we, we thank them and thank you uh, for managing during this tough time. And I know that it's been a lot, but I also want to echo uh, my colleagues uh, and, and, I, and I'm grateful and I thank the mayor administration for putting this in there because I, it, if you didn't have this, it would even be a worse looking picture when it comes to the type of resources that we provide the children and families. But I still have to say that I agree with my colleagues that you know if you take the $119 million out, which is kind of a, a, a standard thing that we really can't utilize in the youth and, and recreation um, because we've made some strides and, 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 I, and I agree with that. We've increased Pathways, uh, 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 to, uh, Pathways to Peace uh, staff. We've, we've done some things that we needed to do in order to increase these services that make a tremendous impact within our community. But however, I, 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 have, I, I too believe that when we begin to look for cuts, and when we begin to, to do things that even though we're in unprecedented times with this particular budget, the last thing that we should be looking to cut within our budget, especially when it's one of the, the lowest amount of allocations that a department receives is it tends to be uh, youth and recreation. Now, when we look at 2034 plan, when we look at what we're trying to build a city for the future for our children, when we look at budgets reflect your priorities, Budget reflects what you are saying is a priority to you. And to me, when you look at this budget, if you were to look at it without knowing the knowledge that we're all presenting and that we all know of, you would think that priorities for our city is not for our youth and our families. And that's not the message that we want to send to our community. So, I, and I think there's a direct correlation between the surveys, even though it's not the greatest survey, but it, but it is a tool. And the survey, and, and you look at the survey, it's low when you when you look uh, when it comes to youth and recreation as a priority. So, and I believe that that's a direct correlation between the the, the priority of dollars that we put into mm -hmm. this particular portion of our budget. So it's not an attack against the administration. It's it's, it's a challenge to this administration to say how, what things can we do, what can we really look at to say you know what our our our, our families, our youth, and I know it's important to everybody. And I'm not saying it's not, but we need to reflect that. 
in our budget as a priority of something that is dear to us, our youth and our families. Because at the end of the day, this may be all they have is our youth and recreation centers, as well as the expansion that we're looking to do with our sports recreation uh, facilities that we just built for youth defense, which is amazing, great vision. All of these things are gonna take dollars and, 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 and we know that we can't fund it all. We're gonna have to find external forces and people to be a part of that. But I just want to reiterate and echo with my colleagues that I, and I say this every year, every bunch of year, I've, I've been a, a component and an advocate and I know I'm, I'm, I'm public safety passing with fire department. I understand what you know, public safety is dear to people's heart. 40% uh, of our budget almost approximately goes to that. I get it. But at the same time, we have to begin to look at ways that we can increase our, our vision and our, 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 our purpose of, of, of prior, what's, what's a priority to us, to us. And I would love to be able to see these percentages, 5% right now, I would love to be able to see these percentages start to gradually go up year by year that it begins to show that we are committed to our, not that we're, I'm not saying that we're not, but we, it must show, our commitment must show based on our dollars because at the end of the day, you put your money where your mouth is and that shows your true priorities with your budgeting. So I, I believe it's a much bigger issue that we have to have more conversations about and we have to maybe think outside of the box and how can we help to bring external partners in to help us with funding, what things can we do to advocate federally, what things can we do to advocate state. We have to build a coalition around our children and our families to show that we're committed to them and we're not just gonna say it, we're gonna show it by putting our money where our mouth is. Thank you. So. Uh I, Chris, I know you want to jump in here, but I, I want to be very clear on a couple of things because I think that it's, it's very important to let the record accurately reflect. Um, as we talk about the taxes in the city of Rochester and how much we collect in taxes um, and the fact that um, probably about 68% of those taxes go directly to the school district. And so the priority, so that's, you know, 32% that we have to fund youth services, police, fire, a 911, and all those other things. Um, we all know the financial situation that we're in right now when it comes down to the state dollars as well as uh, sales tax revenue. And so I understand what people are saying. The other thing that I think that you want to know, and in, in when you look at the budget book on page 12-13, um, you have a transfer there. So it's not that those dollars are going away. Uh, YVOV program transfers to youth services, the Bureau of Youth Services. Literacy program transfers to Bureau of Youth Services. So it, it comes out of recreation and goes into another bureau. It's not necessarily cut out of the system 100%. The other thing uh, is that we lost a significant amount of money from our um, pregnancy prevention program, a, a major grant that we had with the, the federal government. Uh, they are no longer funding that program. And so some of these dollars that have been taken away have been taken away because of uh, grant dollars that are no longer being provided. And so I wanna give proper context to what's happening across the board. And just because you might see a negative or a minus in front of it, doesn't necessarily mean that that was an intentional cut. It might've been a cut because of grant dollars. For example, our summer literacy aids was funded by the city school district. That right now, I don't believe is funded right um, at this point in time because they have budget constraints. The, the issue, as I said, around pregnancy prevention, um, the state has taken on some of that responsibility, but that program was cut significantly by the federal government. Uh, Duran Eastman uh, Beach, uh, the funding is not there because at this point in time, as last year, the beach levels were too high and, and therefore we were not able to have um, services down at the beach and we anticipate it being the same way this year. And so we wanna make sure that we are, we're given the proper context of what's happening across the board and not just looking at it in a silo as if the city cut it by 5%. There are different buckets in different places where those cuts took place. And as I said, the unintended consequences as it pertains to employees, we're going to take a look at that. And Chris, I know you wanted to say something um, and I jumped in. 
Well, Mayor, I, that's exactly what I wanted to address. So I'm glad that you did. And I just wanted to, you know, to kind of to point that out overall. If you look at 12-3 uh, in this budget, you'll see that the year-over-year -year change department-wide for dries, you know, while it's down, it's down $258,000 overall. You know, and again, that that's despite the fact that, um, you know, we have this pregnancy prevention grant of 259,000 that doesn't recur, right? So. To the mayor's point, there are a lot of things moving around here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to um, uh, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, I got, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted. My son's room and he's keeping time. He said two hours to your, your things over. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go to council members uh, Ortiz and then uh, council member Lupian and then Pio. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, there's already so much that's been said. Um, I think many of us have some of the same issues and questions. Um, I know that uh, the research will be done and thank you very much. I would be in support. I understand the vision and the uh, transition that you're trying to make here. I would be in favor of ensuring that those folks that are affected would be red circled or grandfathered into their current salaries and let's move on with our transition. I understand that means a lot. So I look forward to seeing that research, Chris, on how we might be able to achieve that for folks. Um, so I would be in support of that. Um, I do have a question for um, us. How many of the 10 are transitioning into the four or are any of them? Three of them. So three out of the 10 will take on the one of the four. No, three of the people who were in the, yeah, three of the people who were in center director roles will be the community center managers. Okay, and they so have, that okay. Sorry, so that leaves seven, seven folks that are being transitioned downward. Correct. Plus there are, there were also three supervisors that had remained. So just to be um, have the record reflect that, that there were the center directors, but also um, there were three supervisors. Okay, thank you. And so this says phase two. How many phases do we have um, as far as major changes like this? Are we, is this it? Or do we anticipate that there are further changes for the, the vision that you have overall for this department? The only uh, the only thing that is uh, left is what I alluded to in terms of adding in another opportunity for a senior position to be developed. Um, so that's a that would be an opportunity for advancement to add to the career ladder. That's the that's the piece that's still remaining, and that would that's just dependent on available uh, funds for us to be able to work that into a subsequent budget year. Okay. Um... And then can you refresh my memory? Um, who is going into the Chambers building and is anything happening to 400 Dewey? So, uh, oh, sorry, Mayor. So as it pertains to the Chamber building, the Dries administration um, was in, I believe, three separate buildings. And so the Chamber building includes all of Dries administration. Um, and it also provides um, youth programming um, in the center city. So it has a, you know, right across from the bus terminal, uh, youth are able to have their own, um, you know, uh, programming and, and it, they enjoy it. Um, I, I, if you haven't visited, I would say that council take a tour over there because it's really extraordinary to see. We also have people that um, we're working with um, outside contractors, community organizations to rent space in that particular building as it pertains to 400 Dewey. Uh, the, the goal is to move the, the police department's TAC unit over there from, from J Street. Um, right now that building needs a significant amount of work. Um, and so we are looking to move that particular organization from off of, um, not J, it's, it's Child I believe, um, Child Street over to 400 Dewey. Um, and uh, because of the COVID, that situation has been pushed back a little bit, but that that is the plan. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I really, 
don't have that many other questions, I guess just a request as we go through this process of researching and trying to figure out what might be possible and what shifts might be able to be made, if we could be made aware of that prior to having to vote on this budget, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, let me just move uh, quickly through everyone so I can make sure we get everyone in. Um, um, council member, and if you can, and if you can uh, be conscious of other folks who need to um, speak, council members. So I'm going to go with council member um, Lupian P. O. Harris. Um, so we can go in that order. You had to say that before I speak, huh? No, it was. It was um, <laughs> uh, I wonder how is the um, 10 minute walk to parks being rolled out? So we have, um, we've been working on the 10 minute walk uh, for a couple of years now. And the first phase was to do an assessment to identify five parks that we could um, improve access to in different ways. And we identified those parks um, and to, to reactivate those parks. And so we worked on Tacoma Park, which was one of those parks. And the next park that we're working on is Don Samuel Torres. Uh, so we are continuing the work of what we explored in the 10 minute walk and we continue to receive um, technical assistance from National League of Cities and Public Land Trust as well as pass through funding that we have been able to um, you know, secure and partner with Ibero to work on um, activating Don Samuel Torres Park. Okay, um, and um... So there's, it sounds like three more parks to work on and then what is the, the next phase? Uh, from there, we will um, go back to, to the um, 10 minute walk, redo another assessment. So after we've made the improvements that we have outlined in this, this multi-year plan for these five um, locations, we would need to revisit our park score and see what the next recommendations would be. Thank you. Um, so I noticed um, Play Streets Rock was uh, two events were estimated in um, this last year, but we're estimating 13 uh, in the new uh, budget year. Will, do you anticipate that being impacted by COVID and do you think that number will be changed? We actually anticipate being um, able to do more outdoor things um because okay. of, of covid so we are planning to gear up and to make sure that we are doing low risk leading low risk play um throughout the summer uh and this the outdoors play is a is a perfect way to do that so we'll be able to shift gears in um in terms of what we are able to do it with with play streets as well as with our rec on the move wonderful that's great news um, just two more questions quick. Can you say how many salaries are supported by the boxing program? Um, the, the boxing program is a, is a, a contract, so it's, it's not a staff position. Okay. Um, how many people, I guess, what do we get for the contract? So um, there's, a, there's a daily um, program that will be occurring, continuing to occur. So there's a daily workout program for youth and there's also adult programming that's going to be happening. Um, so there's a programming four to five days a week being provided uh, as, a, as a part of this contract. Oh wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, and is that uh, free of charge? It was very well attended. Um, part of one of the things that we did when uh, we um, started to run the uh, Trent Jackson and Pamela Jackson Art Center was to rebuild that program with a, um, a national boxer as one of the things that Vice President Lightfoot worked on. Um, and I think that, you know, when we did the ribbon cutting to see the number of kids that were really excited about the program and wanting to be a part of it, that is going to be something that is really, really powerful uh, to be offered again. And we've known that children in our community have wanted that program for a while. And um, the person that um, ran it before, I think his name was uh, Mr. J Johnson, um, passed away. And so being able to have um, 
uh, what's his name? Um, who's the boxer that? Charles Murray. Charles, the natural Charles Murray. Murray. Charles Murray um, come in and do that program is something that, you know, is a benefit to us. And, uh, I, I, you know, we would love to be able to expand the program. I also want to note that, you know, over, you know, when we look at what we're doing around sports program, the fact that we have taken on the responsibility of um, running the Trent and Pamela Jackson Art Center and making that a full service Art Center to the community um, and uh, especially um, on North Clinton Avenue, um, as well as seeing that there is definitely still a need on the west side of the city uh, where it pertains to the, the Southwest, um, the SWAN uh, program that was being run out of uh, uh, Wilson Foundation Academy. Um, there are things that we are taking on as, um, as the DRIES department to make sure that we have services throughout the community for our young people. And when we recognize the challenges that they are facing and what the community tells us, we're stepping in and stepping up. And I wanna commend the commissioner and her team for that. And so I don't want you know, things to get lost here in, in some of the different changes that's happened because just because changes is happening doesn't mean that there's significant cuts. Uh, the, the cuts are not necessarily there. There are changes and movement around to respond to what our youth and our young people have been telling us as the Department of Youth and Recreation. Thank you. And my final question, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I hear everything um, that you and Commissioner Lyman Torres are saying, um, but I do agree with my colleagues that um, who have spoken that, you know, for the individuals, um, you know, it, it could have some real lasting um, impacts on them. And so I appreciate that you guys are willing to go back and take a look at that, um, those unintended consequences. Um, my final question is, um, can you explain a little bit how the center manager position job description is different than center directors? What new responsibilities will they have? Yes. So the community center manager position um, is a position that's going to be charged with all aspects of staffing, um, community relations, um, program development, um, managing the, the attendance um, and facility as well, facility management as well. The, um, and, and the budget, uh, the budget for that, those particular sites. <laughs> so the center director's um, position has really focused on, um, you know, being the on-site supervisor, they've submitted work orders in regard to facility management um, and manage the staff schedules and the staff time, um, timekeeping, um, as well as um, some center directors have attended um, NSC meetings um, and some center directors who work with uh, schools that are either attached or in proximity have, um, you know, maintained working relationships with principals. So the main, the main difference here is that there were um, multiple levels, center directors and area coordinators um, that in the area coordinators were really doing a significant amount of performance management, staff training, facilities, um, budgets, managing contractors and programming um, that the center directors was not, were not doing. Uh, in this new position, these functions, the, the leadership of these uh, sites is gonna fall into this, to this manager um, and be something that this manager is responsible for all aspects of that. And so that's, that's, you know, in a nutshell, describing the uh, differences in the duties. So it sounds like the, um, some of the center director duties, like making schedules and um, program for staff and programs, um, that'll be on the center manager? Yes, they will have to ensure the staffing for um, all, of the, all of the sites, yes. Um, and just one, follow, one more follow-up. Um, for each center manager, how many sites will they be in charge of? Um, that that depends on the on the number of sites that we have, um, you know, functioning at certain times. So right now, again, the plan was designed for six of them, uh, six community center managers. Um, each one of them uh, could potentially have uh, two sites that they were overseeing with four. Um, we would have um, some community center managers that will be overseeing uh, more than two sites or three sites. Um, 
but we also do we also did take into account a couple of different things in this year one of those being you know the impact that COVID will have on our operations um the hours that we're able to operate um the length of time we're able to operate the capacity at which we're able to operate as we reopen as well as we've taken into account that we there's a number of facility improvements that have been approved um, and are underway and so Flint Street Art Center, for example, is going to be closed for a portion of this fiscal year for renovations, followed by the Douglas Art Center, then followed by the Edgerton Art Center the following year. So there are some um, changes operationally that come into play. Um, and so we've, we've tried to, to manage those things. So I, I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Councilmember Pio, and then Councilmember Harris. Uh, real quick, I, you know, coming from a different mindset, uh, being from the military, we're talking about directors and supervisors who took civil service exams to get to the position that they are in now. So to get a demotion in both pay and in their level of um, position or title, to me, that's like that's a really big deal. It would really impact anyone in the military. So someone in this position going from a was it, 21, 23 level to a 12 level, that's hard. That's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow on my end. Uh, I'll end it with that. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Second thing is uh, publicly congratulate again, Ray, for your promotion. I want to put something good into the air here. Congratulations again. Thank you. Um, Council uh, Member Harris. Thank you. Um, I just would like to ask a question on page 1220. Um, I see that um, I'm going to assume that the seasonal soup staff was reduced because of COVID. Um, Commissioner, can you please comment a little bit about what that that represents there? Yes, um, we have we have reduced our seasonal um, staffing based on what we know is going to occur this summer because of COVID. Can you um, explain to me how are they handling the summer, um, the soup staff as relates to, I mean, I'm sorry, this SOOP staff as it relates to how you're managing this summer? Yes, um, we are, um, we've been working throughout this process. We work in partnership with Rochester Works and together we collect all of the applications for youth um, who would like to be employed and then we separate them out based on city residents or county residents um, and employer types. And so we manage the process together and we have done this as an online process completely this year. It was one of our goals to maximize online document uh, collection. We just didn't uh, realize how much we would have to completely convert to that this year. So staff have been spending a lot of time walking families, parents, um, and, and youth through how to upload documents, um, how to attach do the needed documentation and how to get their process completed. We've extended the application it's process. It's been a rolling process. We've actually not shut it down. So we've done all we can to continue to um, try to get more youth to con uh, participate and fill out their, their online application. We have received um, over 1,700 um, applications, even despite the COVID, uh, uh, the COVID situation. We have been working with employers to who are still going to participate. Some employers have withdrawn from participating because of COVID, but those who have stayed, we have supported the development of COVID um, plans um, and um, how PPE will be involved and used and how, stat, um, how youth and employees would be trained by us on PPE and on social distancing and be a part of that um, process. So we have moved forward. Um, there will be youth that will be placed in employment and um, we're working with employers and youth to, to make that happen the best that we can, but it has been an electronic process um, and a lot of telephone support. That's good news. I am. Um... Okay. Uh, I just want to note that the governor announced that summer um, programming uh, or camp will be open on June 29th. We have not had those guidelines yet. And so uh, we anticipate that open recreation would be a part of that. And so we probably, so we will be in the process of working with the state 
and the Department of, of Health to figure out um, cleaning and other things that we would have to do and the guidelines to actually operate that. Um, now that we've learned that um, they we will be opening on June 29th. Well, they'll be allowed for summer camp. It doesn't necessarily mean that we would be opening then, but. That's good news. I um I just wanted to just clarify. You said that it's still open for application for soup. Are you still accepting applications? We we will still accept applications um up through Monday the eighth, and then okay. we've we've already started the placement process. But we will still accept applications. Thank you. Um, and my my final question is, um, I agree with my colleagues as it relates to you know the unintended consequences and thank you so much mayor and commissioner um that you guys will take a look at that but i'd like to ask that can you submit an org, org chart as it relates to the proposed changes and that way it will help it will help us better understand you know where everything is going to put, be placed an org chart for this upcoming proposed changes compared to how how things are set up now Sorry to interrupt, Council Member. Uh, those were already submitted as part oh. of a request, and I can re-forward them to you. So okay. you thank sure you. To get those. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Council President Scott, and then Council Member Gruber. Thank you, um, Ray. Would you be kind enough to update me or Mayor Warren, whomever, on the changes that have occurred to? Um, Pathways to Peace, what's the restructuring? What does that look like now? So, uh, so I'll, I'll let the commissioner um, come in and, and turn it over to, to Ray. Um, the congratulations to Ray is that he is has been selected as the MBA, MBK coordinator. Um, as you know, uh, the My Brother's Keeper program um, was uh, something that was funded through a grant uh, with the State Department of Education. The city school district actually um, received the funding. And one of the programs is to actually hire a coordinator. And um, council, I believe, approved that position back in February or March. And as you know, many positions were in transitions were delayed because of uh, the COVID. But um, you know, when Superintendent Dade and I were here, uh, when Superintendent Dade was here, we talked about um, having someone that had been involved in the MBK program from the very beginning of being started and someone that had a relationship with the school district um, actually taken on that role and agreed that Ray Mayalise would be, uh, that we would both sign on on him leading the charge um, because he's been involved in the MBK program from the very beginning. And so it is our, um, it is our you know, intent that he will transition over to the MBK coordinator role. And then we will be hiring a new director for the Pathways to Peace program. Well, I add my congratulations to you, Senor Mayor Lise. But can you tell me how Pathways to Peace is structured now? Are we, is it still like in after hours or is it in schools or how is it operating now? How is it structured now? Commissioner, you want to address that or you want me to? Uh, no, Ray, go ahead. So at this point, we've, uh, as you know, we've gone to a, an all part-time team. We do have school-based team as well. And uh, we've been able to increase our visibility and our hours in the evenings uh, from 3 to 7 p.m. up until like 9, 10 o'clock in the evenings with more visibility throughout the whole city of Rochester. Um, the school base are now still in five schools that have been chosen by the school district based on uh, increased suspensions, long-term suspensions, um, and also their absenteeism rates in those schools and uh, violent in those schools. So those schools will continue um, as long as they're identified by the district. And right now we're looking to increase, as you see in the budget, expand pathways again to increase two more uh, part-timers to add to more visibility and more hours throughout not only weekday, but also the weekends. And I think that's, I'm sorry, four more staff, not two, four more staff. That would take us to about 17, 18 total part-timers throughout the whole city um, as we move forward. 
And that includes special event coverage? That also includes special events coverage. Yes, it does. And the district uh, was providing some special event dollars for their services and, you know, and that would include special events for us as well. And for the school-based contingent of Pathways to Peace, who's paying for that? The school is, it's through a grant. That grant has been extended for another five years. Okay. All right, wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, President Scott. Ray, am I my brother's keeper? I am my brother's keeper, yes I am. <laughs> <laughs> Those from the 90s know what that is. Uh, let's go to. Um, All uh, right, uh, Neil Brown. <laughs> <laughs> New Jack. Uh, no, New Jack. <laughs> Council Member uh, Gruber and then um, uh, Vice President Lightfoot. Thank you. Um, thanks for the update on Pathways as well, and congratulations, Ray. Um, just wanted to know I, it's uh, terribly sad about the. Uh, the pregnancy prevention grant being gone, and it's uh, obviously very much in line with the Trump administration's priorities. I, I really hope that we have an opportunity uh, to look at how we can pull some of that together through some support from local foundations. Um, and and I, that's a conversation I'd be happy to have because I know some foundations, as I'm sure you all do, they're probably thrilled, not necessarily to fill the entire gap, but some of it. So that, that's just a comment. Um, I have two quick questions. One is uh, I'd like to just have a, a, a brief update on, uh, on La Marqueta. I think this is an incredibly important uh, project coming up. And um, I, I'm very grateful that the city of Rochester is one of the few cities that not only has a public market, but is expanding our public market places. I think that's an incredible thing. Uh, and we're doing it with very little staff. I'm wondering uh, if we're prepared to do that and uh, what we think the first year is going to look like. Um, thank you for the, the question, um, Council Member Gruber. Um, we, we are prepared. Uh, we have been working with uh, the community um, in regards to La Marqueta and how we can work with Ibero uh, the same, in some of the same ways that we've worked with the Friends of the Public Market so that we have a support system for operations. And so Ibero um, will be providing support, site support um, for operations at the site, as well as coordinating the events and coordinating how that will work with the community and community engagement around the site. So it's through partnership that we'll be doing that. Uh, the project is on track from a construction standpoint, as well as um, from uh, the standpoint of looking at our anchor vendors um, and the kiosks that we will have at, um, on the site will be prepared. Um, and, and on time and ready to go. Uh, so at this point, everything has continued to move on along, um, you know, on pace and on schedule. We were able to continue our community outreach uh, through virtual sessions that we, we transferred from in-person sessions pre-COVID to virtual sessions. Um, they were well attended. We've got a lot of questions from potential vendors. We've provided them with, um, uh, assistance through the Office of Community Wealth Building, MBD, and REDCO. Um, so all, all, all of us have been working together along with IBERO, and we're, we're really looking forward to um, being able to open up the site this fall. When, when will vendors be selected? So um, vendor, the anchor, the anchor vendors, um, that process is going forward right now. So th there are people who have submitted applications, for that and the, the committee will be taking a look at that and they'll be selected. The other vendors will, will work like the public market in that they will come forward and um, purchase, you know, whether they wanna be daily vendors or take out a seasonal license. Um, so that'll be something that is an, uh, an ongoing process. Thank you. And my, my last question, and then I'll zip it is, um, I understand, um, this is not a place where I'm going to argue about budget cuts. I understand completely Duran Beach um, and the cuts that have to happen there. They're sad, but I, I get it. I'm wondering um, what is the opportunity for Monroe County and our Parks Department to have some more intermunicipal agreements around this and some help from them? I'll jump in here. Um, so back in the um, the Bob Duffy, when Bob Duffy was mayor, um, they actually took the 
Duran Eastman Park back from the county, the maintenance, we had an agreement with the county like we have with Ontario Beach uh, Park um, and Ontario Beach that the county, it would be a county park. Both of the, the, both of the beaches were managed by the county. Um, at the time, um, my understanding, I, I wasn't on council at the time, but my understanding was that uh, there had been an incident where someone had drowned at the Duran Beach because um, there had not been a lifeguard there. The county was not funding lifeguards at Duran Eastman. And so the mayor made the decision to actually take that park back and take that beach back and to manage it um, ourselves. And so it's been one of the things that we've been managing since that contract um, has been changed. I know that the deputy mayor was um, over at the county at the time and maybe has additional information, but um, I don't believe that this is one of the things that the county is going to want to take back and manage through an intermunicipal agreement uh, since that was actually, um, uh, that was one of the things that, that the mayor at the time took away from the county or they made an agreement to uh, disband it as it pertains to Durant Eastman. Um, Deputy Mayor Smith, are you on the call? Uh, he may not be, he had another, there was another meeting uh, that he stepped out for, but we can provide you with more information. Mayor but, Warren, oh, that's helpful. Mayor, thank you, Mayor. Thank Mayor you. Warren, point of clarification, I believe you mean the beach, not the park. The beach, yes, the beach. Uh, not the park. Ontario Beach Park. Not, not the, oh, okay. I'm thinking Durant, okay. No, right. I, so what I'm saying is that, let me clarify. At the time, Ontario Beach Park, as well as the beach, as well as Duran Eastman Beach were managed by the county. And the county was in charge of providing the lifeguards and the services there. The county funded lifeguards at that time at the, the Ontario Beach but did not fund lifeguards at Duran Eastman Durand Beach. Right. and someone ended up drowning. Right. And so the mayor at the time felt that he, he wanted the city to take the responsibility for Duran Eastman Beach and providing lifeguards there in the summertime so that that could not happen. But Duran Eastman Beach has been closed for the last two years because the lake levels are too high um, for people to be swimming in. And so we anticipate that they will continue to be at that level. And so what I'm saying is that I do not believe that the county would like to engage in actually managing Duran Eastman Beach because of the issues that they had there before. And it wasn't necessarily that they were funding lifeguards there. Um, whereas the city made an, a commitment to fund lifeguards mm -hmm. at, at the beach. Great, um, Vice President Lightfoot. Yeah, I want to also um, congratulate Ray. You know, I've been working very closely with Ray uh, in the um, Think About It campaign, the Rock Against Gun Violence Coalition. We've done a lot of work. And to your point, uh, Mr. Chairman, we all we got, you know what I'm saying? So, right. you know, uh, with that being said, uh, this also brings a challenge to us, um, uh, Ms. Commissioner, because, um, you know, with 20 years of experience, working in the field and being a credible messenger. And we know that work is all about relationships. And now, now we're gonna to have to replace that position. And so I, I, I just, I guess, you know, what strategies or how are we going to, is there somebody else already that may have been uh, and raised in, in your, um, you know, you may have been training or behind, you know, underneath you that could, could, could I'm not saying we could fill your shoes, brother, but, I'm, I, but what I am saying is that that's a critical position a critical position that is built on relationship, deep rooted relationships that have been built over, I believe 20 years. And so um, that's going to be um, very, very important that we really, really pay attention to making sure that that position is filled by the right person. I'd just like to kind of hear what is the strategy for that? 
Well, um, Vice President Lightfoot, it's just as you've described. Um, we we understand um, the the importance of the position, the relationships, the ability to to be a credible messenger and to relate to other credible messengers, and to um, you know to connect, to have the skills around uh, mediation and de-escalation, and you know really be uh, also serving as as a role model for uh, for the youth. And so um, we were taking all of those things into consideration and criteria around, you know, what what would be, you know, ideal uh, characteristics that we would be looking for in um, in the next manager uh, position. And and so, um, you know, as our chairperson, I look forward to, uh, you know, speaking with you and working with you on that further. Thank you. Thank you. And. Um, just before we end, I want to thank, um, I, I, I think it's important to note, note too, the work that, um, that uh, and I believe this is through the department, Youth Voice One Vision, um, Mayor's Youth Advisory Council. I mean, that I, I came up through those things um, as, a, as, a, as a young person. So I know how important they are. And I know that the mayor understands the importance of um, getting young people involved and connected to the process early, because we both know personally where it could where it can lead to. So I think that that is something that has continued. And I want to thank um, the mayor and the commissioner for continuing that uh, that piece of young youth development, you know, developing young people to become leaders. And I think that that's sometimes that's something that's um, lost that a lot of people may not know that um, is taking place um, at, at, at the city, but it's been going on for a long time. And I want to thank um, the mayor and the commissioner for continuing that um, to continuing that uh, at going forward. So thank you so much for that also. You're welcome. Um, so that concludes our um, hearing for Dries. Um, thank you, Commissioner Torres, um, for joining us. Greatly appreciate it. And we'll take a um, quick um, five minute break, uh, reconvene for, um, with Mr. Soretto and his team um, on emergency communication. So let's just take a quick five minute break.
Okay, we'll, we'll uh, reconvene if folks are ready. Um, I want to thank the director for uh, joining us today for the emergency communication uh, hearing. And um, Director Soretto, I will turn it over to you to uh, introduce your team, and then we'll get right into um, questions related to your section of the budget. So, uh, Director Soretto. And I think uh, you're, yeah, you're muted, Director. Okay, there you are. Uh, I'm having problems hearing the director. Can can anyone else anyone else hear him? I can no, not. Okay. Yeah, director, we're having problems hearing you. Can you turn your um? Can you turn the mic up, Mike? You if you are on a um a smart screen, then you may need to call in from a phone so we can see you and hear you at the same time. I'll email the call information. So Director Soretto, you may need to call in on a landline or a, a cell phone. Okay, let's take a um, two minute break so um, the director can, um, call in through the phone. Yeah, I've had to do that a couple of times too, where you got to call in through the phone and then you can see see the screen, yeah. Yeah, I think that has something to do with those smart boards that yeah, yep. they're, they're not connected to Zoom well right. Auto, through right. the audio. So, yeah, so we'll give, him, we'll give him a two two minutes and then BJ, once he's um, reconnected, we can just, um, we, 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 can, we can take it from there. So just, just hold tight uh, folks for about uh, two to three minutes and then we'll get it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get things back. Contract. Just want to see if uh, it's working for you now, Director. I saw that uh, phone number entered the room and I saw you were dialing. I imagined it was you. We still cannot hear you. 
you're on your phone is on mute potentially. Try now. Hello. Hello. You're in. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, let us I reconvene then. For the, uh, uh, technical difficulties. That no, no problem, Director. Thank you, and um, welcome to the budget hearing. Um, what I was saying, and I'm sure you heard me, was we want to give you the opportunity to introduce your team that is with you, and then we will go um, right into questions with your uh, with your section of the budget. So you can take it away, Director. Thank you, and and welcome. I uh, appreciate you having me here this afternoon. I'd like to introduce in the middle behind me, Tomatis Rivera. She's our training coordinator. I'd like to, to my left is uh, Deputy Director Amy Mills. And to my right is Deputy Director uh, Greg Roney. Uh, Dr Director Mills handles the administration, administrative function at the center and uh, Deputy Director Roney handles the operations side. Thank you. And I'm we'll ready, start. I'm ready. We'll, thank you. We'll start with questions from um, Council Member Patterson. You have questions? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Director, for, for meeting with us tonight. My question actually comes from out in the community. I received a phone call a couple of days ago at, during the troubles, because um, that's what I'm calling it now, the troubles. And their request and their question was, is there any way they could get some confirmation um, of a contact with 911, what their meaning is, if they call and they call an event in, is there a way that later on they could get a text message or an email back just letting them know an officer was dispatched or something along those lines? Is that a possibility that 911 has or is looking into? We do not have that ability right now. Um, and I don't even know if that would be feasible, but I'd be willing to look into it. Fair enough, sir. Thank you. Council Member Harris. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Um, Evans. I uh, like to direct this question in regards to page 8.3. I, I noticed that you guys are working on accreditation compliance and I see that there's two different um, listings. Can you explain to me why would be why would be there be a need for two accreditations? I think that's most impressive, but I'd just like to know more about it. Well, one is the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, and the second one is the New York State Sheriff's Association. Uh, the reason that we have both is because we uh, not only do we dis dis dispatch for um, Law enforcement, we also dispatch for the, uh, the local sheriff's department. Thank you very much. How long have we had those accreditations? Or is that new? We've had them for a few years now. Thank you. That's most impressive to have two accreditations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman council Ortiz. Concludes. Any, uh, any more, Councilmember Harris? Okay, Councilmember Ortiz. Yes, um, I just had a general question. With all of the activity that we had going on over the weekend, um, how did our systems fare in terms of the call volume? There were a couple of folks that I had uh, spoken to that said they couldn't get through to 911. So I'm just curious um, if you could give us a little bit of an assessment of how it all went for you all and um, yeah, what that looked like for you all and the volume. Well, uh, I will start off by saying that I I've, um, was, was extremely um, busy on our end. Uh, we had brought in additional staff to staff every every uh, telecommuter position that we had, but the volume was just um, very much over the top. And, uh, but we answered 18, we answered over 1800 calls from uh, eight o'clock to 11 o'clock. And we answered over 4,800 calls for the entire 24 hour period. So it was extremely busy, but I felt that uh, not only did the system hold up, but I felt that our, our staff 
which is, you know, they were outstanding. I don't, you know, I don't think I could stress enough the job that they did under extremely, uh, under extreme conditions. Okay. So you, we didn't get any concerns or questions about not being able to get through to 911? I didn't I receive any. No, <laughs> I, I think okay. so. I think sometimes what happens is because it's 911, they expect it to, people expect it to get answered immediately. And what happens is when it goes into the ring, it, uh, as long as they stay on, they'll get an, it'll get answered. Okay. But they okay, weren't, well, it, it wasn't, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I, you know, they're, they're not, they weren't quick phone calls that were coming in. They were coming in from, from citizens that were scared and, um, and the calls took, took a lot of time. And they also took a lot of stress on our, on our operators. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, that uh, everything went well, and that uh, if uh, good to know that if people just stay on and let it continue to ring, that it'll get picked up. But thank you so much for all of your team and your service. Um, I'm sure that was definitely uh, a scary time. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I go to Councilman McGruber, my, my um, quick question. I, I think I ask this every year. Um, I, I think. Now, with, with, with all the events and things that have happened, we always realize how important uh, 911 is. But how's, how is um, recruitment and retention uh, uh, going? Um, strategies that you might have to uh, continue to attract people to the, to the, um, to the profession? And, um, how, and once they're there, how, how, what, do we have, what have we been strategies to continue to keep people um, to stay? Well, I think that last year we had a very aggressive uh, campaign that uh, we participated in at the direction of, of the mayor, and she helped us uh, in, the, in that participation. Went all around to different events throughout the city. I think we were extremely successful in recruiting uh, individuals to take our exam. Um, once we get individual uh, hi individuals hired, um, I think that it's very easy for us to keep them. Um, things that we've been working on, me and my staff, to work on the retention is uh, to improve the work environment. And I think I've done that in the last 18 months. I think that people that work here have noticed the change and I think they're happy with it. Great, thank you. Um, Councilmember Gruber. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Director Serretto. Uh, I just want to put in a quick plug. I went and took a tour of the facility a couple months back just before COVID hit and uh, learned a great deal. So any, any council member who has not been there yet, I think it's, uh, it's an, an amazing place to go tour and see just how um, tight and efficient the, the uh, services are over there. Just a quick question in terms of staffing on 8-4. Um, you mentioned that there's gonna be four uh, new on-call positions to comply with the new New York State discovery law uh, for a net increase of about 140,000. I'd love to hear um, what, uh, what the new law is. And then right under it, it says that uh, overtime is decreasing by about $120,000. I presume that part of the reason why overtime is gonna be able to decrease is because of the creation of these new positions. Is that right? That, that's going to help us uh, decrease our overtime. That's correct. Uh, just to give you a quick overview on the new discovery law, uh, the new discovery law requires the 911 centers to uh, turn over anything and everything that we have at our facility uh, regarding any particular case. So it's a, it's a very, very, very time-consuming effort uh, to provide this information. So uh, like last year, we had uh, approximately 2,200 requests for information. Uh, this year already, uh, at the end of May, we're at 4,400. And not only have the requests doubled, the volume has quadrupled. So th while they requested 2,200 pieces of information in uh, 2019, that information was, uh, was limited to basically maybe the call uh, to our center and the CAD message. So it's, it's really a tremendous burden on, on our staff here, but we are keeping up. We've came up with different ways uh, to gather this information efficiently. 
and we are keeping up with it uh, at this point. I hope I answered your question, Kelsey. Number. Yeah, you did. It sounds like it's a lot more work for you all. And one of the ways you're doing it is uh, in, a, in a very kind of thoughtful and, and cost effective way is adding more positions and making sure that overtime is distributed in a more it, it is distributed with a little bit more uh, eyes on it and supervision. And I think that's a great, a great move and will probably pay dividends for the department. Thank you. Any other um, Any other questions and comments for um, the director. Uh, um, we, uh, uh, council member Lupian has some questions. Surprise, surprise. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead, council member Lupian. <laughs> I've been talking for so long, I forgot how to say my name. Um, I was just wondering, I, I see GIS in a couple different departments, and I'm wondering. In, in this, in you know, an emergency, what what does the GIS analyst do? And and I don't know if you can answer this, but how is it different from other GIS functions, particularly in um, IT? I guess I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Well, I guess maybe what's the what is the job description for this? The GIS analyst. Um, that position was actually eliminated oh. during 1920. Okay. Um, so there won't be one. Um, Mike, you might want oh, to talk. That, about that, the county is yeah, actually I can, taking I, role. I, I can I can speak on that. Uh, Councilmember, that that position was uh, eliminated in, in on our end, and the county is going to be picking up those duties. But we're, with the GIS function of that position is is to assist with CAD, computer aided dispatch, to make sure our mapping is is up to date. Okay. And they're to coordinate okay. with the county. So the county is doing that for Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Vice President Lightfoot. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Evans. Just real quickly, just because I want to be consistent with my praise. Um, we have, um, during this COVID-19, of course, it's just been a tremendous uh, work that individuals have been doing and your staff, sir, uh, you and your staff have, have done a tremendous job as well. I, I know that the stress of, of being uh, on the front lines, I've, I've been there, and uh, to for I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge uh, the work of you and your staff, and I wanted wow. you to make sure that you give the, the sentiments of the council to the staff that we appreciate the hard work, and that's a tough job, man, sitting there on that phone talking to people when they're you know they don't know you know what's going on and they're they're upset and they're scared and they're frustrated and it takes calm people, it takes people that are consistent, people that really are rooted in faith and rooted and strong rooted in who they are to be able to do those, these type of jobs. So, you know, I just wanted you, you to know on, on behalf of, you know, myself and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same way uh, that we thank you uh, for the service and all of your essential workers that have been just working continuously through COVID-19 this pandemic. So I just wanted you to, to, to express that to you and your staff. Thank, thank you, you, sir. I, I, I couldn't be prouder of the people that work here. Thank you. Any other um, questions or um, comments for uh, the director? Okay, um, hearing none, um, I want to thank uh, the director for uh, his time and your team. And again, um, thank you for all that you uh, do and will continue to do um, on behalf of the citizens of Rochester. Uh, so this will conclude our budget hearings for today. I can tell by looking at everyone's face. Um, it's tough not being in the room, but I can tell by everyone's face, you guys are wiped out. <laughs> so um, you'll I get a break. I could go four hours. Yeah, right. You'll get a I break. Um, I got a lot of questions. I'll yeah. just be nice. I know. Uh, so feel free um, to keep um, any questions that you might have between now and... Um, in our next hearing on June 9th, you can submit those in writing, feel free to do that. I wanna thank um, the mayor and um, the administration for uh, being just so well prepared um, in, terms of, in terms of getting getting questions even before we um, got to the budget hearing, we got information on questions that we might, might have had coming into the hearing. And that is um, something that the city is known for. I mean, the city is great at getting um, council members um, prepared for these hearings and that, and that is, um, extremely helpful. 
And I want to thank council staff um, for all of their um, their work, uh, BJ Scanlon in the clerk's office um, as well. So we're going to um, adjourn this hearing if there's no other. We'd like, to, we'd, we'd like to thank you, Chairman Evans, for keeping us moving and keeping it on track. It was very well organized, uh, firm, but flexible. We appreciate well, that. Thank, thank you. I like you. that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good slogan. I'm going to use that slogan, firm, but flexible. <laughs> Here we go. Um, but thank you, everyone. And um, I look forward to speaking to you all um, next week. Council Member Lupe, and if you have questions that you want to ask, I'll, you can call me. I'll put my phone on speakerphone, and we can keep you know, pretending like we're in a, in a hearing. But Thanks, I want to thank you all um, for your time today. And I look forward to speaking to everyone um, next week for budget, but in a couple of days for agenda review. So thank you. OK. Tomorrow for agenda review. Is that tomorrow already? Oh, yes, man. sir. Right. Oh, yeah. Thursday. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's Okay. So take care, everybody. We, we apologize in advance for the number of items that you have this month. <laughs> I saw it. I'm listening to that thing. You are all quietly crushed. <laughs>